Okay, hi. So in this video, we're going to speak about the alkali metals. Now, the alkali metals are those found in group one of the periodic table. And so if I was to highlight them, it would be all of these guys here. Now, notice that I haven't included the top member of group one because that is hydrogen. And we know that hydrogen is not a metal. Hydrogen is a gas. So hydrogen does not appear in the alkali metals. Okay, so what do all the members of group one, including hydrogen, have in common? Well, the fact they're in group one means that they all have one electron in their outer shells. And so I'm not going to draw all the electrons because, of course, it differs for each um, element. But if this is the outer shell, we are going to find one electron in that outer shell like so. Now, bear in mind that all the metals, so everything below hydrogen, they all have eight electrons, or I should say eight electrons for the metals that you learn. But as we go down to rubidium, cesium, francium, they have even more. But they all have at least eight electrons to fill up an outer shell. Now, each metal, well, let's just say the metal is given the letter X. That X represents all of these metals, okay? Now, those metals, they could either, in order to obtain a full outer shell, they could either accept seven electrons from somewhere else, or they could just give away one. And obviously, energetically, it's a lot more favorable for this electron to just leave. So this electron will go away somewhere else uh, when these metals react. Now, the fact that it's very easy for that electron to leave means that the group one metals are very reactive. So they are very reactive. And this is due to the fact that a single electron is very easy to remove. Now, what we can also say is that when we are talking about the alkali metals, so I'm just going to box them off here. These are the alkali metals. The reactivity will increase as we go down the group. Okay, so the most reactive alkali metals are the ones down the bottom. So francium, although that's not really found as a metal, cesium is found more commonly as a metal. So cesium is an extremely, extremely reactive metal. Okay, lithium is still reactive. But in comparison to cesium, rubidium, potassium, it's not as reactive. Now, the reason for that is the ease at which you can remove the electron. Now, this electron, okay, so the one here, this needs to be removed. Now, if that can be removed easier, that means that the reaction will happen more. Uh, sorry, you'll need less energy to cause the reaction to happen. So the ease at which that electron is removed tells you how reactive something is. And so it's easiest to remove the electron, the electron. Okay, that is because the electron, if you think about something like potassium, the electron is found way further away from the positive nucleus than it is in lithium. So let me just show that in this diagram. I'll get rid of the X for now. Let's say that this here is your positively charged nucleus. We know that nucleus has a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. Now, if this was lithium, let's say this is lithium, okay? Lithium has one shell, which is full up with electrons and that's found in the center. Okay, so this is the first shell. It then has the second shell with one electron in it. And so this electron here is still relatively close to the positively charged nucleus, okay? And so that means that the electron is attracted to the nucleus. We do have some shielding from these electrons as well, which means that the increased positive charge of the nucleus does not as much affect these outer electrons. Now, by contrast, let's have a look at potassium. So let's zoom down. Potassium will look something like this. Okay, so this is our potassium. Whoops, there we go. And you can see that the outer electron on potassium is way further away than the from the positive nucleus. And that means that it's feeling less force of attraction to the positive nucleus, and so it's easier to remove. Now, the fact that the distance is greater means that those electrons can be removed more easily, and therefore potassium is more reactive 
than lithium because these elec this electron sorry on the outer shell of lithium is closer to the nucleus okay you might you may counter that argument and say that well potassium has a way more positively charged nucleus and you'll be absolutely right however there is a force which is counteracting this, which is known as electron shielding. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about that in this video. I may do in a later video, but for now, you just need to know that this is a phenomenon that does exist. Okay, now other general properties of the alkali metals. Now, they are generally low density metals. Okay, low density. So much so that uh, sodium actually floats on water as do lithium and potassium. They are also very soft. So soft actually that with a, uh, a regular knife you can cut through them. So that's pretty uh, strange for a metal because we normally associate metals with being very hard. But the group 1 metals are very soft. And they are also very shiny. And they have a silver colour. Okay, silver colour. Now finally they all react here we go. They react with non-metals, non-metals, to form ionic compounds. Okay, ionic compounds. Now this is because they can just lose the one electron and form positive ions. So they form positive with a plus one charge ions. Okay, finally, they have low boiling points, low melting and boiling points in fact, low melting and boiling points, and that is when compared to other metals. Obviously, if you have a look at something like oxygen or carbon dioxide, um, their boiling points are way lower than the metals, because all of these metals are solids at the normal room temperature. However, the melting point decreases, so this arrow just means decreases, as we move down the group. Okay, and just to give you an example, let's go back to our periodic table. Cesium, which is here, let's just draw an arrow in there. Cesium has a melting point, M point, of 29 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's very low. So if you go into a, a reasonably warm room, cesium will actually turn into a liquid. So that shows you just how low their melting points are um, for metals, that is. Okay, so now let's move on to their reactions. Okay, so the reactions of the group 1 metals. Now, something that all the metals, um, all the alkali metals, that is, react with is water. So they all react with water. Okay? Now, bear in mind when we're speaking about reactions that we've already discussed how reactive the metals are. So the metals further down the group, uh, when you're looking at cesium and potassium, are going to react the most violently. Whereas lithium is the least reactive metal in group 1. So that will not react as violently as the rest. Okay? So when we add... So if we add lithium, sodium, potassium, uh, that's not an I, sorry, that's a comma, to water, okay, what we get is the metal floats because they're so, well, their density is so low, and we get fizzing. So we get fizzing. Now that fizzing is telling us that a chemical reaction is happening because fizzing, or effervescence is its um, scientific term, tells us that a gas is being produced. Now because potassium is so reactive, okay, potassium actually causes a flame to be produced. It reacts so vigorously that it catches fire. It catches fire, but it doesn't look like normal fire. It's actually a lilac flame. You don't need to know why it's lilac, but it is. And if you do it uh, in a lab, then it's a pretty cool experiment to do. Okay, so you need to be able to write equations for what reaction is actually happening. And it's going to be the same for all the metals, okay? They're going to react in the same way. Obviously, just um, potassium reacts more vigorously. 
So if we take sodium as an example, okay, and we add water, you're always going to produce, uh, you are going to produce the salt, which is sodium hydroxide, okay, but that is in solution. And the fizzing you get is because of hydrogen gas, okay? So sodium plus water makes sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. Now, if we're going to put the state symbols in, obviously sodium is a metal, it's solid. Water is a liquid. Sodium hydroxide is dissolved in the water, so we say that that is aqueous. And hydrogen is a gas. Those are the bubbles that are being given off, okay? So we've got all the state symbols all in one equation. Now, if I were to say, can you write the equation for potassium reacting with water? Try and pause the video now and give it a go. Okay, so I hope you had a go. Now, potassium reacts in exactly the same way as I said with water. So it's potassium plus water is going to form not sodium hydroxide this time, but potassium hydroxide, which is also in solution, plus your hydrogen gas, okay, and that is it. You could be asked to write this equation um, for any of the group one metals. Most likely it's going to be sodium, potassium, or lithium though. Okay, right, finally, we have the reactions with halogens. Okay, so halogens. Now the halogens are the group sevens. So if we go back to our periodic table, up here, the halogens are here. Okay, so these are the halogens. Okay, we're going to do a separate video on their properties, but you do need to know that they react with the group one metals. And the common example that you're going to use is chlorine. Okay, so let's say that we have sodium and we add to that chlorine. Okay, now you will have heard of sodium chloride because that is just table salt, we are going to produce sodium chloride. Okay, now, sodium is a solid and chlorine is a gas. So we have chlorine gas and sodium solid. Sodium chloride or table salt is a solid as long as we're not um, doing this in solution in water. So we are going to produce a solid. Finally, we will see that this is not balanced because we have two chlorines on here, but only one chlorine in sodium chloride. We therefore need two sodium chlorides to balance that. And therefore to balance the sodiums, now we have two sodiums, we need a two in front of the sodium. And this is now balanced. Okay, now the group one metals will react in the same way. So potassium will form potassium chloride, okay. Um, and they will also react with the other members of group 7. So that includes fluorine, bromine, and iodine. Okay, we're often not asked questions on fluorine, but the rest of them will normally show up. Okay, and that is it. So I hope that was helpful. I hope that's cleared up uh, the properties of the alkali metals and the reactions that you need to know. If you do have any questions on that, please do feel free to write a comment in the box below or send me a direct email. Please don't forget to subscribe um, because there are more videos coming out very soon. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.